Um, greetings to all of you, uh, to the participants who are joining us uh, for the e Academy, but also uh, to the general public joining us um, from the virtual world. Today, the CIL e Academy Distinguished Speakers Lectures is extremely honored to have uh, with us Professor Joseph Weiler, um, someone who really doesn't, one of those few people who really doesn't need an introduction. He's so well known, but I will take the opportunity to just give a very brief summary um, of uh, Professor Weiler's background. He is, you know, he's a professor at uh, NYU, um, holder of the European Union Jean Monnet Chair at New York University School of Law, and co-director of the Jean Monnet Center for International and Regional Economic Law and Justice. Uh, he is also president of the European University Institute, Florence, Italy. Um, he's a professor at National University of Singapore. And may I say, I think uh, we're very pleased to have him as a member of the Center for International Law and work with him, particularly uh, through the ASEAN. Um, he has honorary professorships at different uh, universities. Um, really, his biography is online. There's so much he does, but may I say <clears throat> that he's also uh, founding editor of the European Journal of International Law, the European Law Journal, and the World Trade Review. He is one of the world foremost experts on trade law. So we are extremely fortunate to have him be with us today, particularly since he's coming to us from New York and it's, I think, three in the morning there. So this is true commitment on his part. And today his lecture is very interesting. The WTO and international law, why the much vaunted WTO dispute settlement regime does not deserve all the accolades showered on it. Uh, dear Professor Weiler, on behalf of Patricia and ourself, myself, we welcome you. The floor is yours. Let me start sort of by saying almost all institutions uh, in international law like elsewhere in, li in life you can look at the half empty part of the glass or the half full and I will start with the half full but the core of my lecture will be looking at the half empty and uh, as you will know from your studies in international law very often the issue of adjudication and enforcement of international legal obligations is the dark side of the moon the soft point spot of international law, uh, millions of obligations, but when it comes to disputes among states, uh, it's often the mechanisms for adjudication and enforcement are weak. Uh, having international tribunals, having binding decisions, having enforcement of binding decisions uh, is very often the scarce element of the international legal system. And the same was true historically for the WTO in international trade law. Uh, the GATT was a major achievement which regulates trade relations among states. But when it come, came to dispute among states, the GATT had a fairly weak dispute settlement uh, procedure. It consisted of the po possibility of states in case of a trade dispute to ask for the appointment of a panel, form of arbitration if you want, and uh, then the panel would meet and it would resemble judicial proceedings and they would issue a decision which would go to the dispute settlement body of the WTO, which consists of representatives of all the member states, and uh, they would uh, supposed to ratify the decision of the adjudicatory panel and uh, that was the system in place until the WTO was established in 1995. And uh, in some respects, it was a joke because a state that did not like the idea of a panel could uh, refuse the convening of a panel. But more importantly, when the decision of the panel went before the dispute settlement body to be approved and ratified, 
the rule was that it had to be a consensus decision of the dispute settlement body, which if you think for one second meant that the losing party in the arbitration, in the decision of the panel had a veto power. And if they didn't like the decision, they could exercise that veto and the dispute settlement body. And it was as if the decision was not given. And the result was that it was not a particularly important or particularly effective dispute settlement procedure, because although it was used not very frequently, effectively the only disputes that it decided were disputes where the states in advance said to themselves, we don't mind if we win or lose, because if, uh, if it was a truly contentious issue, one knew that the losing state would basically block the decision and it would be as if it never took place. And that is the background against which the reform of dispute settlement in international trade took place in the establishment of the WTO. And compared to the past, indeed it looked as if this was a major revolution, not just in international trade law, but in, in international life generally, because under the uh, new WTO dispute settlement procedure, and you will hear a lot about this uh, tomorrow, uh, a state could not refuse to convening of a panel. And more importantly, the rule for the uh, WTO dispute settlement body, which ratifies the decisions, uh, instead of a positive consensus, all states had to agree, it moved to a negative consensus. Consensus There would have to be a consensus to reject the panel decision. So effectively all panel decisions would be adopted. So now we had in place binding dispute settlement, which indeed in international life is a hugely important change. If you were a member of the WTO, you were submitting yourself to binding dispute settlement. And Another major innovation, in addition to the panels, the so-called appellate body was established. In effect, it's the World Trade Court. They don't call it a court because the Americans uh, refused that appellation. So it has this technical uh, bureaucraties named the appellate body, but it is an instance of appeal from decisions of the panel. So states, it was a kind of package deal. Okay, if we accept binding dispute settlement, we want to have an instance of appeal and the appellate body which sits in Geneva in Switzerland was established. So de facto overwhelmingly decisions of the panels are appealed to the appellate body because the losing state would typically appeal the decision of the panel. And then there would be an authoritative decision, a binding decision by the appellate body. So compared to the past, this was a major important innovation. And to add to this success story, a regime of enforcement uh, mechanisms was put in place so that if a state against whom a decision was taken uh, did not follow the decision and refused to put it into place, a system of enforcement mechanisms by the losing state was put into place. So the three cheers for the revolution of dispute settlement in international trade grew even louder. Not only do we have binding dispute uh, settlement, but uh, we have binding in, uh, dispute settlement, including mechanisms for enforcement uh, through a system of sanctions against the state which refused to follow the decision of the binding uh, appellate body, the binding decision of the appellate body. And again, this was considered a very important innovation to the system because under the traditional system of uh, public international law, even the august International Court of Justice can issue a decision. And if the state doesn't like it, they can say we are studying the decision we will think about it, we will look at it but there's no institutionalized system of enforcement. Uh, ultimately, it could go to the Security Council, but you can count on the fingers of one hand uh, the number of decisions of the World Court which actually went to the Security Council. 
And since very often the violators of international law, and this is also true of international trade law, are the most important states, the Americans of the world, the Brits of the world, etc. Since they sat with on the, they were permanent members of the Security Council, what would be the point of taking the United States to the Security Council if they could veto those decisions? So you will recall perhaps from your other studies of international law, the World Court issued a decision against the United States in the matter of death penalties and the Americans just did not follow it. Uh, there was a stay of execution and the Americans went ahead and executed the people they wanted to execute, pretty barbaric. And what could one do against it? To take it to the Security Council, the Americans would sit there and veto it. So against that generic background, it seemed uh, as if the WTO was a breakthrough in terms of both adjudication and enforcement of international economic uh, obligations, given binding dispute settlement and enforcement mechanism. So even today in the literature, and I'm curious what you will hear tomorrow, uh, it's considered a major achievement and one talks about the legalization, the juridification of the WTO at the center, this wonderful dispute settlement mechanism. And to repeat, this is the half full part of the glass against the general background of weak adjudicatory and enforcement mechanisms in public international law and equally weak adjudicatory and, adjudicatory and enforcement mechanisms in the international trading system Indeed, the new system was revolutionary, important. Uh, it seemed as if this is a model to be followed by other international organizations taking international law seriously. Pacta sunt servanda, agreements should be honored. And if not, if there's a dispute, there will be binding judicial procedures with enforcement mechanisms. Well, uh, reality is often very different from how things look on paper. And I want to highlight three elements in the existing system of dispute settlement and enforcement of the WTO, which darken the picture and suggest that not everything is as it's meant to be. The first and most dramatic difference and this is the one, even though if you come with a background from public international law, it should be staring, in you, staring you in the face. You hardly ever see it mentioned in the literature. And there's a huge literature. If you got Google WTO dispute settlement, it will burn the screen of your computer. The number of articles that are written and all of them saying what a wonderful institution, a model for other international organizations. The thing that staring you in the face, and if you thought about it for two seconds, would make you scratch your head and say, wait a minute, how could this be considered an improvement of the international legal system is the following. So now fasten your seatbelts, and I will describe this, uh, what I consider this truly radical, if you want, it's okay to be a little bit provocative, assault on international law. If we ask ourselves, what are the most fundamental pr principles of the international legal system? So we could mention one, I already mentioned it in passing, Pacta Sum Servanda, if you sign a treaty, you have to observe your international legal obligations. And then principle number two, which is at the core of state responsibility, if you do not fulfill your obligations, if you're in violation of an international obligation, your state responsibility is engaged. And once your state responsibility is engaged, you are obliged either to bring, you're obliged to bring the violation to an end, but it doesn't stop then, there. You, if your violation has caused material damage, there is the principle of restitutio in integrum. We like Latin, don't we? If we practice law and we use Latin, we can increase our fees. It sounds so much more pompous and important. 
So you have to restore the situation to the way it was before your violation. Very often that is difficult to do. So the default position, which is the norm in international law, you have to pay reparations to the state which was whose rights were violated by your failure to enforce to follow your international legal obligation. And very often these are monetary uh, reparations, make good for the damage your violation caused. And this is a basic intuitive core understanding of what international law means. If you violate, you have to bring your violation to an end and compensate the state, make reparations for the damage suffered as a result of your violation. Am I right or am I right? That's at the core of the international legal system. If we look carefully at the draft articles on state responsibility, which is one of the great achievements of the International Law Commission, although never translated into a treaty, these are treated as if it is a binding treaty. No state has formally objected to the articles on state responsibility. There's a tiny little map provision at the end of the draft articles on state responsibility, which says, this is the general law, what I've just stated. If you violate, you have to make, you have to bring the violation to an end and make reparations. But it says there can be a lex specialis, states can agree on an alternative regime. And this is where the WTO comes in. Because with all this vaunted binding dispute settlement and a system of uh, enforcement mechanisms. It's all very nice. But what the WTO did is to say, when a violation is found, it goes before a panel, bindingly a state cannot escape it. And then it can go to the appellate body. And then we have an authoritative decision and what is the obligation of the violating state? It is to bring the violation to an end. And here is full stop. And it's what is not mentioned in the WTO is the second element of state responsibility and make reparations for the damage you caused. And that has been eliminated. So you are in compliance with WTO dispute settlement merely by bringing the violation to an end, but there's no obligation under the WTO system to make reparation for the damage suffered. Let's think about this for a minute. Why was it so popular, the WTO dispute settlement uh, system? It's because there's such inequality in international trade law between the big powerful states, the Chinas of the world, the United States of the world, Canada, Australia, we used to call them the Gang of Five, and many other trading countries in the international trading system. And if you had dispute settlement as it was in the past, let's settle our differences by negotiation, it meant a huge inequality of power. Imagine a small state like Guatemala or Belize or trying to negotiate the end of a violation by the United States of America, or for that matter, by the European Union, the biggest trading bloc in the world. The inequality of power is egregious. And therefore there was huge support and enthusiasm for the, the new system because it was meant to bring about uh, equality of arms. A small state can sue the United States or sue the European Union or sue China, etc. And before the adjudicatory bodies, everybody is equal. So it was popular. But now let's think of what a system which says the violation has to come to an end, but does not provide for reparation actually means in reality. So first of all, although the agreement, the WTO is an intergovernmental agreement among governments and states, it touches on individual traders. In other words, when there is a violation, and this is true for practically all the violations that come under the WTO, from a formal legal point of view, the violation is against the state, but the victims of the violations are individuals. 
if, for example, take a classic case, Japan alcoholic beverages, the Japanese institute a discriminatory tax on importation of alcohol into Japan. It's the producers of alcohol around the world, social in Korea and whiskey in Canada, etc. These are actual traders who are suffering the result of the discrimination. They can sell less products, they lose a lot of money. And this is true across the board. An intergovernmental agreement which affects individuals. And the material damage of the violation can be huge in hundreds of millions of dollars because when a state violates its international economic law obligations, it means a financial loss across the board. So what happens in reality? Let's imagine that we are sitting in the USTR, the United States Trade Representative or the Directorate for International Trade on the European Union, these huge blocks. And a measure is contemplated, an anti-dumping provision, a tax provision, etc. And somebody pipes up in that meeting and says, hey, guys, uh, this is a violation of our WTO obligations. Now, I don't want to represent that this is exactly what happens, but it can not be false. So somebody says, yes, but we like this measure. So you're telling us it violates the WTO? Now comes a little bit like a Mel Brooks movie. So what's going to happen to us if we violate? So this uh, honest lawyer who's concerned with the rule of international law says, well, we can drag, we will be dragged before a panel. The victim states will take us to the binding district settlement machinery of the WTO. Okay, says the policymaker. How long does that take? And they realistically will say between convening the panel and having the hearings and having the decisions, although on paper, if you look at the district settlement agreement, the whole thing should be over in six months, realistically, it's going to be a year. And then the guy says, okay, and you're telling us we're going to lose. And he says, you're absolutely going to lose. This is an egregious violation of the WTO. So what happens then, says the guy. Uh, and he says, well, you can appeal to the appellate body. Hmm. Uh, how long will the appeal take? Well, on paper, it should be 90 days, but realistically, it can last as long as a year. Okay, so that means already now we've got two years of a violation, which we like, although it's causing damage to our trading partners. And uh, okay, so you're telling us we're going to lose before the appellate body. Absolutely, we are violating. So what happens then? So then we will be given time to cease the violation. Uh, how much time are we going to be given? Well, usually it's going to be about one and a half years to bring ourselves into compliance. Hmm, that's interesting. So now we're looking already at two and a half to three years that we have a violation before we bring it into compliance. That's correct, sir, says the honest lawyer. And what happens then? Well, let's say we take some phony measure of compliance. What happens then? Well, then they can take us before a compliance panel to check if indeed uh, the, we have fulfilled our obligation to eliminate. How long is that going to take? Well, again, if you look at the treaty itself, it's meant to be rather fast, but that too, going before the compliance panel might take another year. So now we're talking about already four years, right? Uh, and then what's going to happen? The compliance body will issue a decision. Uh, can we appeal that? Yes, we can appeal that. So now let's be serious. We stop the Mel Brooks movie. Essentially, a state can go through the entire procedure of dispute settlement. It can take three years, it can take four years, it can take five years. And at the end, one minute before the regimes of sanction kicks in, they can say, okay, now we're bringing it into compliance. And the matter ends then. In those 
years of violation before the dispute began and the years of violation during the dispute where it is not states, it is individuals who are suffering the consequence, material consequence of the violation. No reparation is paid. What's the incentive for a state to comply if, although it's binding dispute settlement, although there is a regime, a regime of sanctions, effectively they're getting a license to go on in violation, violation until the very end. And when it comes to the moment of sanctions, they say, okay, now we're going to comply with the decision and we're going to bring our violation to an end. And the violation could have lasted long before dispute settlement began. And that's the end of the matter. You do not get to pay for the damage, the material consequences of your violation under the WTO dispute settlement procedure. And as I said before, this runs against the core obligation under public international law, which says if a state violates an international legal obligation, they do not only have to stop, they have to make reparations for the damage they have caused. And it's that obligation to make reparations for the damage they have caused, which gives the incentive to comply with international legal obligation. And in the much vaunted system, dispute settlement system of the WTO, the notion of reparations for damage caused simply does not exist. And that is why, although on paper it looks great, in reality, there are lots of decisions that go to panel, almost all of them go to the appellate body. But the incentive to comply is considerably weakened. And the kind of cynical calculus that I just mentioned, although people don't talk about it, is very much a reality of international trade law. So that's the first basic weakness. And as I say, it stares you in the face if you come from a background from general public international law, but it is hardly mentioned. And it's not illegal because the rules of state responsibility say that states can contract out of those, uh, that core oblig obligation of making uh, reparations. Now I want to talk about the regime of sanctions. So what is the regime of sanctions under the WTO law? So let's imagine a classical dispute between the United States and the European Union. And then I will say what happens in real life. So let's say, let's take a case, famous uh, beef hormones decision or bananas decision, what have you where the European Union has been found in violation of the WTO and the European Union for its good and bad reasons decides we are not going to comply with the decision that is handed against us. This is not hypothetical. I could give you equal decisions where the United States uh, is in violation. So now the sanctions kick in. How does how do the sanctions work? The, if it's the European Union against the United States and the European Union lose, so the United States is authorized under the WTO dispute settlement to take measures to enforce the decision. And what, in what consists these measures? So you assess the recurring damage to the United States by the failure of the European Union to comply with the decision. And let's say it amounts to a billion dollars in trade per annum. And the United States may impose restrictions on importations from the European Union into the United States to the tune of a billion dollars. Now that sounds quite effective, doesn't it? So, First of all, what's the, there are two major problems with this. The first one is easy to see. So the European Union are not allowing the importation of beef hormones, beef. 
into the United States from Brazil, Canada, Argentina, and the United States. And it's costing American, Brazilians, Argentinians, Canadian producers a billion dollars a year in damages. So the United States now is entitled to impose sanctions on the European Union. So they institute measures and they say, we will increase our duties on Italian wine, French cheese, and uh, take your pick, uh, British microchips to the tune of a billion dollars a year. That hurts, right? It can force the European Union to come into violation. But the victims of the countermeasures, it's not monetary compensation from the European Union to the United States. The enforcement mechanism is restriction on trade between the European Union and the United States. And who is suffering from that? The innocent producers of French cheese, Italian wine, and British microchips, because suddenly their trade is cut off. They're not responsible for the violation. And even more ironic, it's the importers. If you make your living by importing French cheese, suddenly you don't have French cheese that you can sell in the United States. The violation is by a state, but the enforcement mechanism penalizes individuals. It's ironic, isn't it? And what's even more ironic is that the whole system of international trade is meant to enhance trade and the enforcement mechanism actually restricts trade because it's now not only the European Union that is violating and restricting trade, also the United States with the authorization of the WTO with their countermeasures are restricting trade. So it's like stopping war by going to war. So that's one really serious weakness. And why is that? Because the notion of reparation is not recognized. So it's not if the European Union is causing damage to United States a billion a year, they should cough up and compensate them a billion a year. No, instead the enforcement mechanism is trade sanctions by the United States, which as I said, penalizes individual exporters and importers in both countries. But there's a graver, problem. Remember we talked about equality of arms, uh, how everybody cheered the system because if you took a Guatemala and you took the United States, in negotiation it's a totally unequal paradigm, but if you go before binding this third-party dispute settlement, it reached, it's an e equality of arms. They are treated as equal. Well, are they? Let's take another real life dispute, not beef hormones, not bananas, but internet gambling. The United States bans internet gambling. It is found to be in the violation of the WTO. Why? Because they ban it from outside internet gambling providers, but in the United States, internet gambling is allowed. So if you really didn't want internet gambling, what is source for the American goods should be source for the outside Gander. But they allow providers of internet gambling in the United States, but they don't allow foreign companies. So that's discrimination. It's a core violation of the WTO. So this case, and I was party to it, I should declare that in the interest of transparency, pitted the minor little state Antigua against the United States of America. <clears throat> Antigua wins the case. It takes us years, they win the case. They, are, they were a major part of the economy was internet gambling. They lost tourism decline, so they found this niche. They is your source of revenue to that small state. So we win before the panel, we win before the appellate body, we win before the compliance panel, we win all the way. And the United States just says this, we're not going to comply. So now Antigua is entitled to take countermeasures for the United States, against the United States. So the first thing is to note that this case begins in 2003 and by 2018, it's not yet really settled. The compliance and the uh, countermeasures panel, they give 
a rather smaller world to Antigua, very, very contested in the literature. I don't know, $25 million a year. The Americans failed to comply with the decision. What trade leverage does Antigua have against the United States? Are they going to say, uh, we are going to ban the importation of beef from the United States? Does anybody in the United States care if we sell or don't sell beef to Antigua? They could say, okay, we won't respect the intellectual property rights of American companies. So mm, you can download uh, Microsoft Word in Antigua without paying, without respect to intellectual property. Is uh, Bill Gates not going to sleep at night because of that? It just doesn't work. The system of enforcement, apart from the previous weakness I showed, states violate, individuals pay the price of enforcement. It requires economic leverage. And if the purpose of the dispute settlement was to bring about an equality of arms to treat small states and big states in an equal way, with the enforcement mechanisms, it's just the reality that a small state against the European Union, against a China, against an Australia, the gang of five, the big trading countries, has no economic uh, leverage to actually make effective use of the enforcement mechanisms. So I will end my lecture here. The, I'm sure tomorrow you will hear all the full half of the glass uh, explained to you, but there are these tiny little defects that I mentioned today, which you don't find very often referenced in the literature. But when you are part of the system, suddenly they stare you in the face. And to conclude, I will repeat the two. Number one, the fact that the obligation on the WTO in case of violation is simply to bring your violation to an end but you don't have the stick of making reparations for the damage you have caused, sometimes from years of violation. And once again, the suffering of the violations are individuals, not states. And the second uh, weakness of the system is that when it comes to the mechanisms of enforcement, it's not only states violates, but individual traders pay the cost of the enforcement mechanisms. But if, uh, there is huge economic disparity in terms of trading terms between the winning state and the losing state. The losing state has very little leverage to actually enforce the award. I hope I didn't bore you too much. It's rather technical, but also important. Thank you, guys. And I'm very happy to take questions if there are any. Dear Professor Weiler, uh, beyond boring, I think this was an absolutely riveting lecture. <laughs> Um, and very sobering. Uh, I think you have given us a crystal clear glaze into reality um, and pointing out the weaknesses of the dispute settlement system. And I don't know if how much that was structurally intended or it's simply um, an outcome uh, that, you know, what was planned on paper, this is the reality. Um, but I think that you've really pointed out, and I think this goes across the board to International law, uh, when, they talk, when we're talking about equality of arms, the outputs, I mean, the, the powerful countries, no matter what, always have the advantage. But looking at who are really losing and the law and the fact that there is no reparations, damages involved. So I'm not a trade expert. And I really have to say personally, I appreciated very much your lecture. And I know that we have some questions. Um, uh, let's see now, I have here that uh, from Nico Arnold, he's joining us from the Congo. Unfortunately, do you, do you think you can ask your question? Is your internet stable enough? No, if not, I'm, I'm happy to do that for you. Um, first of all, thank you for the lecture professor. And it is really an honor to be in class by the great Weiler, no doubt about that. A quick question. 
There is a resource for infrastructure deal between Congolese and Chinese. It is known as the Sai Communist deal. This deal is, however, neither a treaty between states nor a commercial contract between a host state and a purely private investor. The reason for this is that China as a state is dealing with the DRC through Chinese corporations. This is the question. In case a dispute arises, which forum is best suited to deal with this? The WTO? <laughs> okay. So he apologizes, his internet's a bit unstable. So that that probably, I don't know if you, if that's um, I'm not really familiar. settlement, I'm not familiar. so. Thank you for the question. I'm not familiar with the treaty signed between DRC and uh, China. So the first thing you would have to look uh, the Chinese are very, very able negotiators. Uh, it's not only a great state, it's a very sophisticated state when it comes to its international relations and international legal obligations. And it might well be that if you look into the treaty, it provides its own dispute settlement procedures. So that would be the default. You would have to use those and one would have to see what they provide and what are the guarantees given and especially what are the mechanisms for enforcement. You would also have to see if they exclude WTO dispute settlement. For example, under the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, now it's called, it's got a new name. You can go to the NAFTA dispute settlement, but the states can also take their dispute before the WTO. So you will have to see that. Always the weak point is enforcement. And all I can say is good luck with the enforcement mechanisms against China. <laughs> all right, don't... clear enough. Um, we have, and your hand is up. Um, I'm, I don't know if I'll do your name justice. Kiai Nusweti from Kenya. <laughs> Please go ahead, ask your question. Uh, you did my name uh, justice, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Professor, for uh, your lecture. It was uh, very intriguing. Um, and my question is based on the example you gave on uh, the beef between uh, the US and the European Union. And my question is, is it conceivable that a party could actually um, plan and have the intention of making a profit from um, the, the fact that there's no requirement for there to be uh, compensation? And they could actually plan and say, because this dispute will take this long, by the time we are required to uh, remove this measure, we will have made X amount of money from uh, this violation. And there will be no economic consequences because we do not have to compensate um, the victims of um, our violation of WTO law. Yes, it's not only conceivable. I can give you examples of this. So under President Trump, it wasn't so much about making money. It was also about internal political games in a forthcoming election campaign, etc. The United States decides totally facetiously, totally everybody knows this is just a game they play. So they impose duties on importation of steel into the United States, etc. Uh, cynically, they know that the procedure will take so many years. And what I described in my lecture is actually a reality. On the 24th hour, a minute before sanctions would kick in, they will say, okay, now we're going to bring it into compliance. And I can give you other example. This is an egregious example because it is exactly a cynical use of this deficiency that I mentioned in the entire WTO system. But even if it's not so cynical, it's inconceivable when the European Union, uh, to give an example, uh, decides they're not gonna comply with beef hormones or they're not gonna comply with bananas. Somebody says, okay, first of all, it will take an awful long time. And then what are the sanctions that they are going to impose against us, etc.? And they make a calculus and they say, it's not going to, we're not going to feel uh, too badly as the European Union, the bite of those enforcement mechanisms, and they go ahead. So I don't want to attribute bad faith to governments, etc. 
but it's almost an ineluctable conclusion when you see the reality. Maybe I can add something. Why am I mentioning the United States and the European Union so frequently? If you look at the statistics of this good settlement, the United States and the European Union are overwhelmingly the defendants in international trade cases. Why is that so? Because the typical violation of international trade is to impose restrictions on imports. They can be discriminatory taxes, they can be unsustainable anti-dumping duties, etc. And for good and for bad, mostly for bad, the United States and the European Union are the biggest trader. They traders, they consume between them more than two thirds of industrial products produced in the world and also of agricultural products. They are kind of a sucking machine to what is produced in the world because they are rich countries with rich citizens. So most sales from countries around the world, be it agricultural products, be it industrial products, are to the United States and to the European Union, and to a lesser degree, some other very rich countries like Japan, China. Uh, although there's less exportation of industrial goods to China because they produce most of the goods themselves. So when there is a tax, a discriminatory tax in a small state, nobody cares about it. If the European Union discriminates, as they often do, if the United States discriminates, as they often do, it really has a major economic impact on a whole variety of states. So they go to dispute settlement. And then we can wish them good luck uh, because of the, uh, these defects that I've mentioned. So it's not just that I, I happen to mention the United States and the European Union, because the reality of international trade that most violations are against imports and the big consuming blocks are the United States and the European Union. And that's why they find themselves in the dock more than any other country in the world. At least two thirds of the cases before the WTO are either against the United States or the European Union, not because they violate more than other states, they don't, but because the impact of their violation affects many more states in a deeper way because they are the two big consuming trading blocks in the world. So the answer to your question, say, I'm sorry I've been long, is yes. What you ask me, I can give you examples of that, but even if it's not so cynical, de facto that is what happens. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your question. And um, we have another question here from Mohammed Reza from Iran. And, Hello, uh, Professor. Thank you for your lecture. And I'm sorry for my camera. It has a problem. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you very well, sir. Uh, thank you so much. My question is in relation between WTO dispute settlement panel and the ICJ. Like when uh, a case between two parties that is uh, responsible, one party is responsible for paying compensation, like I think the China case, uh, leather China case between uh, versus uh, United States of America, is the party able to bring the case to ICJ if one party doesn't pay the compensation and is responsible for that compensation according to RCV or another treaty if they are not agree on to bringing the case to the ICJ? Thank you so much. It's a very good question because it really is an excellent question because you could say if uh, the United States or the European Union, etc., fail to uh, follow the award, then uh, why can't they just use public international law and, for example, go to the World Court in The Hague? First of all, it's never happened. So we have to ask ourselves, why hasn't it happened? Because the default position is they agreed under the WTO that the way to bring yourself to compliance is to simply stop the violation, not to pay compensation. So in most cases, at the end of the story, it can be three, four, five. Internet gambling, as I say, it was 15 years. The state does bring itself into compliance, and that's what they agreed. If, it, if I were a judge on the world court, 
I would say you agreed that the remedy for violation is the cessation of the violation. And you agree that there will not be compensation. And that might be the reason why you never see a case before the ICJ, because in the final moment, the system is complied with, they bring the violation to an end. It might be after years and years. And therefore, the, the China, for example, would simply not have a cause of action before, before the world court. Secondly, we know that to bring a case before the world court, there has to be some kind of agreement, either the declaration made by a state accepting the jurisdiction of the world court or a specific agreement to go before the world court. And when a state doesn't like to go before the world court, they can modify their uh, consent for proceedings. But the bottom line is, I am unaware, and I think it's not just because I am uh, old and don't know what's going on. There hasn't been a single case before the, uh, the world court in the scenario you described. And for the reason I said, because the states in joining the WTO have agreed that compliance with the violation means you stop the violation in a way they mutually agreed, we forego the option of reparation. So the, even if it went to the World Court, which it wouldn't, the World Court would have to say, you agreed among yourself that in this instance, the remedy for violation is cessation of the violation rather than reparations. And that's why I said uh, provocatively, sometimes it's good to be, you, you, some of you might read the British magazine, The Economist. It's a very good way to know if you read it once a week, you know what's going on in the world. And I say that The Economist should have on its masthead the phrase, simplify and exaggerate. It makes for good reading. So my lecture was a little bit simplify and ex exaggerate, although I, I stand behind what I said. Uh, so the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Not a single case before the world court for the reasons I gave. You agreed that there will not be reparations. And if you mention in the WTO the word reparation, you will see how everybody runs for cover. <laughs> Nobody likes that word. And why? Because the state will have to make reparations. And as I said, the damages is suffered by individuals. So why should we get into the business of reparations? Sorry, Professor. Uh, can I mention another thing? Go ahead. Uh, even under the RCVA, uh, can we say the reparation and paying the compensation is become a customary international law and the court must uh, arise the compulsory jurisdiction over that case? No, we cannot say that because with some exceptions, states can contract out of customary law. They can't contract out if it's use cogens, but I haven't heard anybody claiming that international trade obligations are use cogens. So there's no reason, there's no rule in international law that does not allow states to contract out of customary law. If, uh, I don't know, the territorial sea limit is 24 miles, two states can agree, as between us, we will only respect three miles. There's nothing to stop them, even though the customary law might say one thing, you are allowed to contract out of customary law unless it's used covenants. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. And I have here on chat a question from uh, Kerubo from Kenya. Um, I don't know if you're able to, if you would like to ask directly yourself, Kerubo, uh, but maybe, are you able to? Well, all right, then I will read it out. Um, does the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures cover cross-border transactions? And how does the WTO approach subsidies granted to subsidiary companies in a different jurisdiction? However, the parent is within the jurisdiction of the granting authority. Of course, this is not about dispute settlement, but... <laughs> Why don't you ask this question tomorrow when you have Gabriel back? Yeah, you? yeah, but, I think... But, this, but essentially, the, the system, there can be a violation of subsidy by the exporting state, etc. But if it's a violation, 
you can go before WTO dispute settlement procedures, etc. And the same mechanisms, if it's declared an illegal subsidy, you have to bring it to an end. You will go through the years and years of dispute settlement. And at the last minute, the state can eliminate the subsidy. So it's not a different story. There are mechanisms for subsidies for a more rapid countermeasures, but uh, I haven't seen them. Uh, it might just shorten the waiting period a little bit, but it doesn't take away the lack of reparations for failure to fulfill your obligations. You fulfill your obligation the minute you cease the subsidy. So you can enjoy, or your traders can enjoy the benefit of the subsidy and your competitors will suffer the consequences. But the minute you bring it to an end, the matter is closed there. And all the traders in the country which suffer the consequences of the illegal subsidy will not see a penny in compensation. Thank you, uh, Professor Weiler. Uh, do we have, um, we have a few more minutes left. This is a wonderful opportunity to ask questions. Uh, you may feel a little shy, but please um, do ask questions. It's I, I see there's a, there's a lot of interest from Kenya and I'm happy for that. It's one of my favorite countries. I go there often, I teach in Kenya. So next time I'm there, uh, let's have coffee together. Ah, wonderful then definitely stay in touch. So, um, Professor Weiler, um, I, I know that you've been very critical, of course, um, of the um, dispute settlement, and particularly the question of inequality of arms. The traders are the ones who are really suffering from this. But it seems that it's, for example, the U.S. that is challenging the system. What about um, the, the smaller countries? Um, are they challenging the WTO system? Uh, and really, is, I mean, this, the WTO is obviously, particularly because of Trump, has been on, under a lot of attack. What's the future for the WTO? Look, so yeah, we have to go to the half full part of the glass. The current system is definitely better than the system that existed before under the GATT, before the conclusion of the WTO agreement, from 1949 till 1995. So if states thinks how it used to be in the past, of course it is much better. All I was trying to say, it's not as good as most of the literature tends to say. And there are these structural weaknesses that I pointed out. So there, it, there haven't been real attacks because let's thank God for small mercies. It's a lot better than it used to be in the past. But the funny thing is, that no states have an appetite for the concept of reparation. As I said a few minutes ago, just mention the word reparation and everybody will be in the, the cafeteria. Uh, <laughs> nobody wants to hear it, nobody wants to talk about it. So it's worth preserving the system we have. All I was saying, it's not as shiny. It's a shining moon. But like our moon, it also has a dark side, which I explained in my lecture today. Very good. Yeah, I think that's an ending on actually a positive note. But absolutely, we appreciate your um, realistic um, insight into the actual operation. But we also look at it from the half full perspective. If we had time, it's interesting to me to think about what's happening on the foreign investment side where um, the weaker, the poorer states are actually being sent big bills <laughs> from the larger states on these foreign investments. So it's the, the other side. Um, but anyway, that's perhaps a different issue in a different time. So everyone- yeah, but, also, but also there we see the inequality of arms. Yes, because absolutely. If, if, if a small state is sent the bill, the big states have a lot of leverage. But try and recover the award in investment disputes against, in the Yukos case, against Russia. No, exactly, uh, exactly. It, it be, I was involved in that case. We won big time. Uh, the lawyers, of course, got their fees, but whether one will ever recover, I think my grandchildren will see that. <laughs> 
Well, let's please have a round of applause for Professor Weiler. This was really a wonderful, wonderful lecture. It was not, it was truly riveting. And I, and, and I might personally learned a lot as well. Um, Patricia, maybe you would also like to say a few words, um, my dear uh, co-director. No, I would just add that uh, uh, you initially said, uh, Professor Waller, that you might be a bit provocative and you were sure were, but I think with good reasons. And then I'm sure that uh, our dear participants um, uh, enjoyed uh, not only the opportunity of having sharing the screen with you, which is really a unique opportunity, but also to ask you very interesting uh, questions. Um, and, and we appreciate also the time that you took in answering um, uh, the questions from the participants. So thank you again so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Weiler. And, uh -huh. and also for joining us at three, three, th three in the morning from New York. So, and everyone uh -huh. here is sending warm messages of thank you. So send, uh, wish me a good night and I'm gonna go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> good night.